Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our um, 2021 Capstone presentations. Um, Will is going to be getting us started here at 3.30 with the first presentation uh, entitled mm -hmm. From Science to Performance in Soccer. Mm -hmm. And after he has uh, presented his presentation, we'll have the opportunity for question and answer at that point, uh, and he has a total of 30 minutes. So, Will, at this time, if you would like to go ahead and share your screen, and when you're ready, you can begin, and then we will ask you some questions when you're done. Can you see it fine? Um, all right, so my, uh, my project's on um, injury prevention in soccer. Um, so I looked into um, all the ways that teams uh, and, and scientists have, have um, come up with like exercises and, and ways of, of uh, preventing injuries in soccer. Um, so my inspiration for this topic um, was, first of all, um, just the fact that I love soccer, you know, I've been playing soccer my whole life um, and, and pretty much everything I do revolves around the game. Um, and uh, more specifically in the fall, I suffered a knee injury and, you know, not being able to play soccer the, the whole year was really tough for me. Um, so I want to be able to make sure that doesn't happen again um, and, you know, prevent myself from, uh, from having future injuries and, and just becoming fitter, stronger, and, and sharper. Um, so my project, I, I followed this this like guiding question of um, how do soccer teams help their players prevent injuries, thus leading to high performance on the pitch. Um, uh, so that was that was kind of the question I um, I followed within my research and presentation. Um, so my mentor is um, Dr. Matthew Lynch. He's the Deputy Chief of Athletic Medicine at, at Yale University. Um, uh, he was really helpful in, in a lot of my research. He um, pointed me in the direction of, of a lot of um, great resources, including the British Journal of Sports Medicine and the Barca Innovation Hub, um, two of my main uh, sources. Um, on top of that, I also you know, found other other good articles and, and lots of videos on YouTube um, that I watched and, and they were all extremely helpful. So now getting into it. Um, so injuries, um, if you've ever played a sport before, um, you've probably experienced some sort of injury, whether it was uh, a bruised tip in lacrosse or a pulled hand. Well, we lost your audio. Um, can you check your settings and see? Dive deep into um, how you can best prevent these um, things from happening. Um, so part one, uh, injuries in soccer. Um, so injuries in soccer are separated into uh, a few categories. Um, the first one is lower extremity injuries. Um, these consist of sprains and strains um, cartilage tears and ACL sprains are some of the more common injuries. Um, unfortunately, those are some of the more severe um, types of injuries, uh, and they can require surgery. Um, some other injuries include um, fractures and contusions that you can get from um, blows to the body, and all of these different types of injuries um, vary in the, in the severity of them. Um, the second category is overuse lower extremity injuries. Um, so some of the most uh, common conditions in soccer are uh, shin splints, patellar tendonitis, and Achilles tendonitis. Um, shin splints are really common in young athletes nowadays, not just in soccer, but a lot of sports. Um, and that happens from, from uh, doing like one sort of motion. So most of the time that's running uh, at a consistent pattern um, throughout like the whole week, you know, a lot of hours every single day. Um, and a lot of stress on your on your shins um, and they can be very painful um, and then some other some other examples are like groin pulls um, fine calf muscle strains and I'll get a lot 
deeper into muscle injuries in my next uh, few slides and then also later in the presentation. Um, upper extremity injuries. So these usually occur from falling um, on an outstretched arm or player to player contact. Um, most common conditions uh, are wrist sprains, wrist fractures, and shoulder dislocations. Um, they actually happen um, quite a bit more often than you think, especially for uh, younger kids when your your bones aren't fully developed. Um, and you know, an injury like a shoulder dislocation is can be quite nasty. Um, can take you out of out of soccer for for quite a bit of time. Um, and the last uh, the last one is uh, head, neck, and face injuries. Um, the The severity of these injuries vary a lot. It can be something as small as you know, a cut or bruise on, on your like cheek or or leg from from a cleat, or something super severe like a like a fracture or or a concussion. Um, and you know, those are uh, much harder to prevent, but they do happen in soccer. So now looking at muscle injuries. Um, so muscle injuries occur about uh, 4.6 times every 100 hours of activity in soccer. Um, the three muscles that take the most time away from soccer due to injury are hamstrings, groins, and calves. Uh, and the most common muscle strains are groins and hip flexors because they are um, much smaller muscles than quads, glutes. And they're, uh, they're quite uh, forgotten about, um, especially you know when you're in the gym lifting, people tend to target the bigger muscles like your quads, like your glutes, like your hamstrings. Um, and they forget about the smaller muscles like your groins and hip flexors. Um, and the average soccer player runs about um, 10 to 12 kilometers a match. And that's a lot, a lot of strain on the body. And that's why a lot of these muscle injuries happen. Um, and preventing them is very key in soccer. Um, so hamstring injuries, I mean, I can do an entire capstone on the hamstring in itself. It's a massive muscle. There's a lot of research done um, on hamstrings, a lot of uncertainty as well. Um, hamstrings are the most susceptible to injury in uh, high intensity acceleration and deceleration. Um, and hamstring injuries have increased in professional soccer annually by 4% since 2001. And because of that um, drastic increase, um, in injury, um, there's been so much research put into hamstrings. So that leads me to the second part of my, my project, which is preventing these injuries and um, exercises that you can do. So the basics in injury prevention um, are having preseason, um, maintaining proper fitness um, after a period of inactivity. Um, and it's important to progress gradually back into play. So, you know, if you're, if you take a month off over the summer, um, come August, when your season's starting up, you don't want to go 100% straight away, you know, playing hours and hours of scrimmaging and sprinting. You want to slowly, slowly get your way back into, into play. Stretching is so, so important. Um, avoiding overuse injuries like your shin splints and getting minor injuries treated is also very important. Um, using correct and safe equipment like cleats that fit you, not using screw and studs. Those are also um, important things, being aware of poor field conditions. Um, three other things that are also very important, which are big categories, and I didn't get into them uh, at all throughout my presentation, um, because, you know, uh, like hamstrings, that could be an entire capsule in itself, and that's hydration, nutrition, and sleep. Um, but those three things are also quite important. So getting deeper into injury prevention in soccer, um, injury prevention is in soccer is all about strengthening the muscles around the joints. And that's to take the pressure off the joints while you're running, jumping, striking, um, all of those motions. Um, most injury prevention work is done off the field, uh, in the gym, at home. Normally, it's by yourself. At the pro level, you know they have physios that help you out with that. But as a kid um, playing for a club team, you don't really have that option. So uh, most of the time, it's by yourself. Maybe it's with a physical therapist or your coach. Um, it's really important to do the dirty work and injury prevention. Most, most kids um, like you know, going to the gym and, and lifting heavy to try and try and get bigger. But for soccer, it's just, it's so important to, to be smart and, and do more functional drills that'll help you prevent uh, injury. Um, and at the end of the day, football or soccer is a contact sport. So there are some injuries that cannot be avoided. Um, but uh, there are a lot that can be avoided, and that's what injury prevention is all about. 
Um, so now getting deeper into things. Um, so workload, uh, there are three variables in measuring workload. Um, locomotive is the first one, and that's all about distance covered, distance covered at high speed, um, sprints, that sort of thing. Um, the second is mechanical, number of high intensity accelerations and decelerations. Um, and the third is metabolic, so that's all about um, high metabolic load distance, average metabolic power. Um, injury prevention is, uh, covers all three categories, but um, more specifically one and two. Uh, that's locomotive and mechanical. Um, so managing the player. Um, at the professional level, not all players train the same way. Um, the medical staff identifies the strengths and weaknesses of each player and puts together workloads based on, on four variables. And those are position, age, time of season, injury record. So if you look at the two pictures on the left, um, the left one in the yellow jersey, that's um, Zlatan Ibrahimovic. Uh, he's around 40 years old, which is extremely, extremely old for a soccer player, especially an outfield player. He plays striker. And he's still going strong at such an old age. And that's because him and his coaches have managed him so well throughout his career. Um, you know, at the age of, you know, 35, he wasn't doing sprints with all the young 20-year-olds and, and lifting, you know, crazy amounts of weights. He was just taking care of his body. Um, so that's, he's a great model of, of how, um, how it's important to manage yourself um, um, based, on, based on who you are and, and where you are in your career. Um, on the right side is Jack Wilshere. Um, he was an unbelievable player when he first broke out as a teenager, um, but because he played so much Um, so sprints, um, a common consensus is that sprinting is the most likely cause for injury, especially the hamstring. And I talked earlier about how um, susceptible to injury uh, the hamstring is. However, sprinting can be a vaccine for um, injuries. Uh, Objective of any effective prevention strategy uh, should be sprinting. And there's actually a study done, done that showed that athletes who perform drills with 95% of their maximum speed are less likely to get injured than those who performed at 85% speed. So basically that, that, that tells us that regular exposure to sprints um, acts like a vaccine towards reducing the risk of um, muscle injury. So there was a survey done called the Delphi survey um, and it was performed by four clubs, Arsenal, Barcelona, Real Madrid, and Roma. And those are four top, top clubs in Europe with uh, great medical um, research, uh, very reliable. And basically, they took a survey of players, not just their own team, but other teams, and uh, came up with different categories of injury prevention, uh, uh, different categories of exercises. Um, and how effective they are and if they would recommend them uh, and what type of exercises fall into those categories. So the first one uh, is sprints and maximal running. And all four clubs said that that was the most effective way of preventing injuries. Um, next is eccentric exercises, which were also very effective. Uh, and eccentric exercises is basically the process of lengthening uh, or extending the muscle while providing force. So an example of that um, would be uh, like eccentric calf raises, Nordic curls, reverse Nordic curls, which I'll get into later. Um, but uh, yeah, so those were, those were deemed also uh, quite effective. Um, concentric exercises were also deemed effective. Um, that's the process of shortening a muscle while providing force. So something like hamstring curls, sit-ups, push-ups, bicep curls. Um, next is uh, isometric exercises, also very effective. Uh, strength uh, training exercise where your muscle neither shortens nor lengthens. So that's like a plank, a wall sit, um, side plank, yoga. Um, horizontal slash vertical plyometrics are also effective. Um, the process of using the stre uh, stretch shortening cycle to generate quick, powerful pre-stretch or counter movements. 
stuff like skipping, bounding, hopping, jump rope, uh, lunges, jump squats, clap push-ups, um, all of those types of exercises. Um, next is coordination and technique, uh, technique exercises. Um, so a little bit less effective than the, the ones I've said so far, but effective. Um, so those are things like jump rope, hopscotch, balance exercises, and then juggle, uh, juggling and dribbling, which are two things you can do in soccer with the ball. Um, next is flexibility exercises, kind of on the same level of coordination. Uh, flexibility is really important in soccer. Um, and it's separated into two categories, um, dynamic stretches slash exercises and static stretches. So good dynamic uh, stretches are things like high knees, butt kicks, open the gates, close the gates, um, front to back leg swings, side to side leg swings, um, rotational windmills, forward backward jumps, forward backward jogs, uh, those types of things. Good static stretches are um, hip flexor lunges, um, standing quad stretches, standing calf raises, um, seated groin stretches, hip lower back stretches, IT band stretches, um, seated hamstring stretches, Achilles tendon stretches, um, shoulder rolls to get your shoulders stretched out, um, those types of things. Um, core strengthening exercises, also effective. Things like sit-ups, V-ups, planks, Russian twists, side planks. Um, and multi-joint exercises are not agreed upon. So that basically means that a couple of the clubs thought they were effective and a couple didn't. I personally think um, from the research that I've done that multi-joint exercises are still effective. Um, that's things like squatting, lunging, um, bench press, um, uh, uh, shoulder press, those types of things. Um, and then the last section, uh, we have one-sided exercises, not agreed upon, um, kind of like multi-joint, I, I think they are good. Um, and that's the same with agility as well. So one-sided exercises are literally anything where you're only on one leg. Um, so those lunges, one-legged squats, those types of things. Uh, agilities, uh, exercises consist of like ladder work, um, box drills, um, figure eights, those types of things. And then the last two, I'm not a huge fan of. Um, not to say that um, they aren't uh, good and you should like never do them, um, but resisted sprints and driving exercises um, were deemed less effective. So now getting into individual parts of the body, um, preventing ankle injuries. Um, so the best one for me is the Y drill. Basically you stand on one leg and you with the, with the leg that you're not standing on, you reach forward, back, left, back, right. So kind of forming that Y. Um, to challenge yourself, you can stand on like a foam pad. Um, and then three other good ones are uh, ankle external rotations, ankle dorsiflexions, and ankle internal rotations, which are basically just having like your ankle um, just hanging freely, attach a rope to it, and kind of move side to side um, with a good uh, um, tension in there. A lot of people forget about their ankles, so don't forget about your ankles. It's really important. Um, they, they are very injury prone, especially in soccer, um, so it's important to, to not forget about them. Um, so hamstring injuries. Um, like I said, a lot of research done, and everyone agrees that the Nordic curl is the absolute best exercise for ham preventing hamstring injuries. Um, as you can see on the diagram on the left, um, basically what you do is you kneel down and somebody or someone behind you holds your feet down uh, and you slowly fall forward. The key is that you slowly fall forward, um, keeping your hips flat. Um, and those are, those are really, really popular. Uh, there was a study done by the British Journal of Sports Medicine where they evaluated 15 different studies, uh, 8,459 athletes and 525 different injuries and came to the conclusion that the Nordic curl reduces the risk of injury by up to 51%, which are insane numbers. Um, so uh, clearly uh, that exercise is really good. Another good exercise for hamstring are RDLs, where um, you stand, um, no, the best one is when you stand on one leg um, with a weight in one hand and you kind of lean forward, keeping your back and, and legs as flat as possible. And as I mentioned earlier, sprints are also quite good for preventing hamstring injuries. Um, preventing quad injuries. So the quad is a massive, massive muscle, um, pretty much the biggest muscle in your leg. Uh, and therefore, 
uh, injuries don't really happen that often there. Um, you know, you can strain your quad, uh, you could pull it, but nothing too, too serious. Um, the best exercise for the uh, for your quads are reverse Nordic curls, which is, um, as you can see, that, that girl on the left um, doing there, where it's, you know, you, you're in that kneeled uh, position and you slowly fall backwards. Um, so those are those are best for your quads. Um, kind of similar to the hamstring, where uh, there's one really really good exercise, and that's for your groin. The Copenhagen planks are really really good. Um, the groin is a very, very delicate muscle, and a lot of people forget about it, but um, it can be quite nasty if you injure it because um, it, it'll feel like it's taking forever to heal. So it's important to, to not forget about it. Um, the Copenhagen plank is, is great for that. So basically, you get in a side plank position like the guy's doing there, and you put your top leg up on like a bench or a chair. This guy's using a rope, um, and you hold it. Um, I recommend 20 to 30 seconds. Um, you can also do it for reps. Um, where you do, where you slowly lower yourself up and down. Um, but yeah, the Copenhagen's are really good. Um, calf injuries. So best for calf, in, uh, for strengthening your calf and preventing injuries there are calf raises. Um, eccentric calf raises, which are basically regular calf raises, except when you're going down, you go super, super slow. So um, that, that really helps not only your calf, but your Achilles and um, uh, a tight or injured Achilles can actually lead to a lot of ankle injuries. So it's important to, to also, um, to also uh, keep in mind when you're, when you're doing your, your calf uh, exercises to also focus on your Achilles. So eccentric calf raises are great and you can, to challenge yourself a little bit more, you can do them on, on uh, a weighted plate or a foam mat for a little incline. Um, glute injuries, very similar to your quad. It's a really massive muscle, so um, most people don't really injure it that often. Um, isolated band walks are really good for, for strengthening them. Basically, you get in a, you, you attach a, a resistant band around your feet, on the outside of your feet. Now uh, you get in a squatted position and you walk side to side. Um, those are really good for, for strengthening your glutes. Um, knee injuries. So knee injuries, as I know, are the absolute worst um, in preventing them uh, and for certain injuries can be impossible, but for some injuries, they, you can prevent them. Um, and strengthening your, your knee joint means strengthening the muscles in your leg. So strengthening your quad, hamstring, groin, calf, etc. Um, the best exercises for that are wall sits, all types of lunges. Lunges are really, really good. Um, forward, sideways, backwards um, lunges. Um, split squats are also really good and so are hip thrusts for your hamstrings. Um, controlled sits and step ups are also really good. Um, yeah, and so uh, FIFA 11 workout is a knee injury prevention program that a lot, a lot of clubs use. Um, if you want to look it up and, and see it uh, in, in more detail, the picture on the left is what, what it looks like. Um, basically, there are three categories. There's running exercises, strength, polymetric, and balance exercises, and then a second section of running exercises. Um, they're really good for, for your knee and preventing ACL injuries in particular. Um, and the last section here is preventing shoulder injuries. Um, and as, as crazy as it sounds, shoulder injuries can happen a lot in soccer. Um, you know, you're, you're in close quarters with a bunch of people, you have an outstretched arm and somebody runs into it and there you go, dislocated shoulder out for a couple months. And that's never fun, especially when it's your upper body and and it most of the time has nothing to do with soccer. Um, so preventing these best exercises are shoulder presses and pull-ups for me. Um, but two other good ones are BOSU push-ups, which are just regular push-ups on the backside of a BOSU ball, um, which is basically like half of a medicine ball. It's like uh, inflated um, and shoulder rolls as well. Um, and the last, uh, the last slide here, um, are other exercises that don't necessarily fit into any category, but are definitely ones to not um, pass up. And those are Romanian deadlifts, um, around the clock lunges, which are basically forward, backward, sideways, sideways lunges, but your, your plant foot is, is on a bit of an incline, so like a foam mat. Um, high plank tucks and then all sorts of pops and, and jumps are really good for um, agility, stability, balance, which does help you prevent injuries because it keeps you fit, sharp, uh, and uh, does strengthen you up. 
Um, it's really important to listen to your body. Uh, one of the most, uh, one of the biggest mistakes athletes make is pushing themselves too hard. Um, you know, if your ankle is throbbing, that's your body telling you to, to get it looked at. Um, it's really important to push yourself and become the best you can, but it's also uh, really important to listen to your body. Um, warming up. So as annoying as it can be, sometimes warming up is extremely important. Um, the best way to warm up is a stationary bike, but most people don't have access to that. So um, going for a light jog is good. Also muscle, muscle activation exercises with using a, uh, an exercise band is also effective. And doing side steps, forward steps, and squats is, uh, are good exercises for that. Recovery, super, super important. Again, stationary bike is the most effective for that. But again, most people don't have a stationary bike um, available, available for them. So you can go for a light jog, a walk. The most important thing for recovery is that you're using the muscles you were just using, but at a much lower intensity. Uh, and then you always wanna wrap up with a, a good stretch. And then the final part is growing as, a, as an athlete. Um, as you can see there on the left, Cristiano Ronaldo, I mean, he's the, the perfect model player, lean, agile, explosive, functional. There are obviously exceptions to, to this, but that's, that's the build that that you want as a soccer player, not some big um, body bodybuilder, but but a, a person that's super strong in all the right areas, but um, doesn't have un, uh, any unnecessary muscle. Um, how to work out like a pro? So professional soccer uh, footballers, soccer players, um, mostly do functional drills in the gym, um, not heavy weightlifting. They focus on balance, stability, a lot of single leg work. They do low sets with, and low reps with maximum effort and intensity. Um, right here is Sergio Aguero. He's been playing at the highest level of soccer for the past 10, 15 years. Um, and he had a, had a video going over a couple of things that he did. Um, so he used that stationary bike a lot, runs so much, um, does a lot of box jumps and cone weaving drills. Um, something that I found really interesting is that he boxes a lot. Um, I found that a lot of professional soccer players actually box a lot. That's really good for cardio. Um, very few heavy training sessions a week. Now that is at the pro level when they're playing you know, two games a week, high, high intensity, um, but he, he takes care of his body so, so well. And that's why he's able to play at the top, top level for so long. Um, Reading Football Club is a team in England. Uh, they did a video on some of their, uh, some gym drills that they uh, like best and have their players do. Um, so RDLs, as I mentioned earlier, are great for your hamstrings. Split squats are also great, just pretty much your whole leg. Um, landmine jerks is what the guy on the left is doing there. Those are also really good. Nordic curls, as I mentioned, are great. Um, and the payoff press, uh, the guy on the right here is doing, are also great for your core. Um, when to work out. So obviously, if you're going to do a heavy lift, that should be on an off day um, or uh, over like your body's ready to go um, and uh, in season workout like I mentioned a little bit earlier is is all about maintenance so keeping the body fresh fit and healthy off season is when you really want to look to build uh, build muscle and, and get a lot stronger um, when you do create an injury prevention workout it's super important that you choose the right exercises um, uh, previous injuries you got to take them into account um, and your exercises should perform multi-disciplinary um, work and, and other recovery strategies. Um, you know, it's, it's important to work on agility and stuff with the ball as well, um, not just the, the strength exercises that I've mentioned throughout. Um, here are some of my sources, and that's it. Well, thank you so much. Uh, if you don't mind, stop sharing your screen, and um, we've got enough time for probably at least one question. 
Uh, so I'll pause here and see if anyone in the audience wants to put a question in the chat or uh, unmute their mic and ask you directly. So Theo is asking, what's your favorite muscle group to stretch? Yeah, I, I would agree with you, Theo. I, I, I'd say mine's also the quads. I, I like hamstrings as well. Um, those feel Will, um, I have one last question for you in your research and in your own recovery from your injury. Um, what did you learn about side to side movement? I, I, I had some information from a trainer years ago that if you start moving side to side abruptly, sometimes that will, um, that will cause an injury quicker in your research. Did you, in the different um, workouts that the different groups use, did you come across any information about that and how to um, sort of prevent that from happening? Yeah, one of the, one of the so like I said, um, the, the best ways to warm up are, are like the stationary bike stuff. Um, but another great thing you can do uh, is just jumping in place uh, and a little bit of like bend the knees a little bit and kind of hop side to side and forward and back. If you do those um, at the start of your warm up, that gets the blood flowing in your legs. And um, uh, normally it's very, very hard to injure yourself doing those because it's light, not a lot of contact there. Um, and yeah, that'll help you warm up. It sounds like small movement then is kind of the key, nothing big or sudden right. or jerky. Just a light, light, uh, light sweat after you're done with warming up. Well, thank you so much. You clearly um, took an unfortunate event in your life and you learned a ton about how to prevent that kind of an injury in the future. So um, we appreciate your presentation and your research. And it looks like there's a number of people on here who uh, learned quite a bit from you as well. So thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Max Corbett at four o'clock. He's going to be presenting on COVID's effect on the business of minor league baseball. So Max, you're gonna have about 20 minutes for the presentation part and then a, a little Q&A at the end, okay? All right, perfect. Hey everyone, welcome to my capsule presentation. Um, I decided to base my project. Hey everyone, welcome to my capsule presentation. Um, I decided to base my project off of how COVID affected the business of minor league baseball. So a little bit about me. Um, my name is Max Corbett. I moved to Guilford in sixth grade. I used to live in Maryland, so it was about a six-hour drive. Um, I currently am a junior at Guilford High, and I play baseball for the high school team. Um, I also tried out for a baseball team over the summer called The Grind, and um, thankfully I made the team, and we'll be mostly playing games and uh, playing tournaments uh, around New England, so it should be a lot of fun. Um, this team's mainly going to help me uh, get into college and play baseball, which is a big goal of mine. Um, I'm a first baseman, an outfielder, and sometimes a pitcher. Uh, I'm a big Sox fan. I love all the New England teams, such as like the Bruins, the Celtics, and the Pats. Um, I like business. Uh, I have a few side hustles that I do just to earn money and uh, continue to grow my interest in business and my knowledge overall. Um, I continue to do research on just various um, branches of business. Uh, right now, I'm trying to get into the stock market, and um, hopefully I get to learn more about that and how it works. So how did I choose this project? Uh, my mentor and I talked about some of my interests and how I could apply my passions to this project. Um, I love baseball. I love the analytics of it, like batting average. Um, on-base percentage and OPS. 
uh, I like how I like to see how how much players make, um, what their contract is, and how how much it increases based off how well they do the previous season. Um, I wanted to kind of figure out for this project how organizations uh, pay their players, um, how they pay their staff, kind of how they handle that. Um, obviously, with COVID, their whole approach to that changed. So I wanted to see how they uh, overcame all of their dilemmas. Um, uh, one of my other interests is business in general. Uh, I love to like, you know, make money, see how people make money um, and uh, stay financially stable in a time of crisis like COVID and just kind of how to overcome adversities in general. Um, for the idea of the project, I kind of combined the two and it came out to be how minor league baseball was affected by COVID. And I uh, focused on the business aspect of the teams. Um, I would definitely be interested in this in the future. Um, this project can help me, um, you know, get into college, get other jobs, and just kind of increase my uh, knowledge over business and baseball. So a little background on minor league baseball. Uh, first off, I decided to choose minor league baseball over the major leagues because it was affected exponentially more. Um, minor league baseball didn't really have a source of income for a whole year, so they had to get creative with how they made money. Um, the payroll of minor league players is extremely low compared to major league players, and I believe they deserve more money than what they're currently getting paid. Um, obviously, the major league players deserve more money, but the wage gap between the two systems is just um, way more diverse and way more uh, large and bigger than it should be. So I believe that we should close that gap. Um, because of the pandemic, uh, the minor league season was completely canceled, unlike the major league season, which was shortened to, I believe, like 60 games last year. Um, the minor league players went over 600 days without playing a single game, which means they didn't get paid um, during their off season. Uh, they had to resort to working two different jobs um, just to get money for groceries. Um, uh, minor league teams in the U.S., Canada, and the Dominican Republic all had to get shut down by the minor league system uh, because they couldn't afford to keep them running. Um, the specific team I focused on for this project to answer all of my questions was the Yard Goats. I interviewed their general manager to get a full understanding of how he ran his business during COVID. Um, minor league players, so they make as little as $7,500 a year. Uh, as I said before, they had to work two different jobs. Um, these people are professional baseball players and they are the best at what they do. Um, and they're forced to work jobs such as DoorDash and the Lyft just to get money. Um, that just shows the problem with how much these players are getting paid. Not to mention, uh, with their season being canceled, they uh, never knew whether or not it uh, resume at any moment. So they had to stay ready and in shape um, because they could get the call and they'd be asked to play like the following week, let's say, and, and they just had to stay in shape that whole time. Uh, to fight for a starting spot on their team. Uh, so they got a lot of support over their um, over the past year, these minor league players. So the MLB eventually announced that they'd be giving these minor league players $400 a week um, because of COVID, which was an increase of 70% of uh, all players' contracts. Um, one minor leaguer by the, uh, for the Tampa Bay Rays his name was Simon Larson, states that it's the most he's ever made, and he's played at three different levels of minor league baseball, being single A, which is the lowest level, uh, double A, which is the intermediate, and then triple A, which is the closest to the majors. Um, these minor league teams, uh, so there's, um, they're called farm teams for the MLB, so um, you have the highest level of baseball, which is the MLB, which is the major leagues, and then you have the farm systems. Um, which they call it uh, pretty much just to literally harvest the players, um, see how they do and kind of grow them into major league players and call them up to the major leagues from these certain minor league teams. Um, so 
who has stood up to help. Um, Sin Su Chu is a former minor league player, and he uh, described his experience in the minor leagues. And I uh, and says, and I quote: "Every day, I had to make a schedule for meals. I had to plan things out. I don't want players to have to do the same thing. I don't want them to have to worry about these kinds of things. Um, people are really having a tough time. I can help. I can help because um, people." I can help people because I uh, because of baseball and I want to give back. Now in the major leagues, uh, Shin Su Chu makes uh, exponentially more money than he ever did in the minor leagues. Um, he admits he struggled just as the minor league players are now. Um, and in accordance, he announced that he'd be giving every minor league player in the Texas Rangers system, which is about 190 people, um, $1,000 each. So. More Than Baseball is an organization which raises money to help minor league players so they can pay for things like food and shelter. Um, personally, I believe that these players should make um, a minimum of $15,000 a year. Uh, these people are the, the best at what they do and they still don't get paid nearly as much as they should. Um, attorney Garrett Broshuis on the right uh, is starting a new petition to help players achieve this goal. Uh, he believes that since the MLB generates $10.7 billion a year, this is the least amount players should make. Um, he's also helped minor league players fight against the MLB for violating their wage and overtime laws. So uh, in general, um, kind of some laws that were put in place to also support the minor league players that can help them. Uh, new federal laws have been uh, designed to for unemployed people. Um, and they can be used as a financial lifeline for minor league players. Um, many minor league players have received compensation far below minimum wage. Um, the, there's a federal coronavirus relief law that can help players receive far more benefits than they are currently receiving. After the beginning of April, MLB pledged to pay all minor league players uh, $400 a week, as I said before, until the end of May. Um, so the MLB stepped up and helped the players. Um, these minor leaguers are paid based off of competition level, uh, the three different classes, the class A, which is on average, they're paid $290 a week. Uh, the intermediate class, class AA, uh, they're paid approximately $350 every week. And class AAA, which is the uh, highest level of competition, um, they get paid on average $502 a week. Uh, these minor league players are considered seasonal apprentices or contractors of the team, so um, not really employees of their teams, rather they're training to be employees or training to be workers. Um, so once they reach the MLB, they'd be considered workers and get paid far more than they're being paid right now. So some of the main problems COVID brought to the minor, uh, to minor league baseball, uh, there was zero revenue generated for these minor league teams. Uh, most teams were very concerned if their program would even stay afloat in this time um, during the crisis. People were surprised um, how much they were affected and didn't know how to deal with this adversity um, they faced, uh, especially with the front office who were overloaded with uh, problems um, concerning their players and staff. Uh, next was without any money um, coming in due to the canceled season, teams had to lay off a number of staff and uh, had to hire new people for the uh, following season. And lastly, without a baseball season, players became dejected of their jobs. Um, they relied on it to get paid for their families. Many players had to look for other jobs and it was an extremely hard time for them. Um, most of them were unsure if they could even continue their lifelong dream of being an MLB player, uh, which they worked on uh, since they were little kids. So Mike Abramson is the general manager for the Hartford uh, Yard Goats, which is a minor league team for the Colorado Rockies. I interviewed him to get a perspective on how much uh, their organization was affected by COVID. Um, as you may know, uh, the Yard Goats built a brand new stadium in 2017 called Dunkin' Donuts Park, costing about $56 million. The Yard Goats led the Eastern League 
which is their uh, conference in the baseball in their minor league system. Um, they led that league in total attendance in 2018 and 2019, accumulating over 400,000 fans um, each season. So all this attendance meant money for the Yard Goats and having such success with advertising their games, uh, they expected a very successful 2020 season, um, but that was shut down due to COVID. Uh, the revenue generated each season is about $2.684 million. Uh, so it was a big letdown when they didn't even have a season. Uh, at the very least, Mike Abramson said that he wanted uh, a shortened season with, with uh, safety protocols for COVID. Um, but didn't even get that. So this shocked their whole staff and they had to generate new ideas of, on how to get money, um, especially because they have $4.6 million in annual debt payments, mostly because of their new stadium. So some of the questions I interviewed him on are shown on the screen. Um, I asked him these about kind of generally his organization and how they're affected financially and uh, some of his responses. Um, how did COVID affect your organization financially? Can you speak to certain elements that were hit harder than any others? Um, he responded, we lost 100% of our revenue for a full year. Uh, the impact could not have been greater. The effect was absolute. So no one area was hit harder than any other. So basically all around their uh, business was affected equally as hard as any part of their organization. They lost all of their money and had no profit or source of income for a full year. Next, I asked him, were you able to retain your employees? I guess that many of them are seasonable. So perhaps they were simply not hired during the 2020 year. How was the front office affected? Uh, to which he responded, we did have to furlough front office staff and make permanent layoffs. Our front office staff is at a reduced level and will remain so through 2021. Seasonal employees were just merely not hired for the season last year, but will be hired this season. Um, so they had mixed solutions to deal with their employees' payrolls. Some employees were furloughed and most were permanently laid off. The seasonal employees were not hired until the current season. Um, that was their way of reducing spending given they didn't have any money to spend in the first place. So next, uh, how directly were the players affected? Did some of the did some of them have to get other jobs? I read about things like David Price, um, who was a pitcher for the Dodgers, giving a portion of his salary to those in the Dodgers system. Was there anything like that from the Rockies? Uh, he responded, "The Rockies employ and pay our players directly, so I can't speak on this." Um, uh, based off my own research, I can infer that the players were not paid. Additionally, if players did get jobs um, after the season being canceled, I assume it wasn't provided to them by their team. This was a main concern of mine, and I believe that they could have handled this situation more efficiently, and I'll talk about some of my solutions later on. So next um, I asked him did the organization work with the city of Hartford get a PPP loan or other state or federal help he responded we did our best to control spending but uh, and made cuts where needed to preserve capital on hand uh, the organization reduced their spendings and furloughed um, employees to help diminish the amount of money they were using since they didn't have a main source of income um, next were there any events happening at Dunkin Donuts Park to raise money or keep interest in the team. He responded, "We uh, a few, we had dinners on the field and a few private rentals. So it seems like the Yard Goats didn't have too many public or private events, which could have made them more money. I did read about Dunkin' Donuts Park hosting some vaccinations, but I would have encouraged them to just host more events in general. Um, next, how has the team or organization headed into this year? Have you done anything differently to prepare, such as discounts on tickets, etc.? He responded, we are not discounting tickets or anything like that. With reduced capacity, we're already basically sold out. Um, most of our attention is on COVID protocols and procedures. So they have a straightforward approach to heading into the season. Everything in the uh, is the same except they are limited at limited capacity, which prevents them from making a lot of their money. Uh, most of their money does come from their tickets anyway, uh, due to the fact that they have such a popular ballpark. Um, next, how did the Yard Goats in 2020 to 2021 
work to help the community, remote programs, on the merchandise. Um, so he responded, we continued a few of our community programs virtually and maintained commi commitments um, to community organizations. Uh, so they didn't change their approach for the involvement in the community, but it seems like they didn't really heighten their efforts to help the community. Uh, I will admit that it was difficult to work within the community uh, with all the given, given with all the, the safety protocols that um, they had. So they did their best with that. Um, so next, uh, Tim Restall, um, the final solution for the yard goats um, that they had for their herding program was the vaccination centers. Uh, Dunkin' Donuts ballpark was use, utilized for COVID vaccinations. While there was a can um, while the season was canceled uh, for additional revenue, uh, Yard Goats uh, President Tim Restall said, uh, "I quote: uh, Throughout the whole summer, whenever I would see the Hartford Mayor, I tell him, let us know what you need. We're not playing baseball, but we've continued to host community events at the ballpark. Things like American Red Bl Red Cross blood drives and Turkey Tuesday, a fundraiser for a local food bank food share. It's about keeping the staff and the ballpark busy." doing the right thing and giving back. So when the city reached out and asked if we'd be interested in being a vaccination site, it was absolutely yes. Um, so vaccinations for the yard goats was uh, very efficient for them to get back to the regular season. Um, they allowed for a quicker recovery for the ballpark. Um, as the more people get vaccinated, the more people are allowed to watch the yard goats games, which was a big help for them. Um, Tom Restall also stated, we're finally getting to the point where we're seeing the score change, where we can take the lead. On Saturday, there were 200 uh, people here helping to change the score. We're pulling ahead, getting back to some level of normalcy, getting back to baseball being played. So these vaccinations were a, a big part in helping their program uh, get back on their feet. So next, what would I do differently? Um, some of my solutions that I came up with. Uh, first, uh, I would make a program to get people jobs or work made up by the front office for the players so that players have uh, work to do. Um, this would benefit the ballpark because they would have willing employees and players could uh, find jobs more easily. Um, next would be to employ the minor league players at the ballpark while the ballpark was doing events. So for example, vaccinations, if they could do something like security, um, that would be good for uh, both the ballpark and the players just to find jobs. Um, next would be to create social media pages for them, um, get their their uh, struggle and their word out to the public of their story about how they need jobs. Um, maybe reach out to like Dunkin' Donuts since their park's sponsored by Dunkin' Donuts. Um, they could post something on their page um, and help them out because Dunkin' Donuts is a big uh, corporation, um, you know, just creating social media pages would help a lot um, with job openings. Um, next, I would push for the MLB to give minor league players money even if COVID didn't happen. Um, I know the minor league players got $400 a week from the MLB, but even without COVID, they still don't get paid enough. Um, so I believe the MLB should raise their contracts. Um, Next, I would double down on community service, such as vaccines, the YMCA, and uh, Boys and Girls Club, uh, double their involvement with the community. I feel like that could help a lot. Um, and lastly, I would do a PPP loan. If they went through a PPP loan, which is a paycheck protection program, the staff would have had more money and they wouldn't have had to let off as many people. So this PPP loan is a two-year loan. Uh, it covers up to two months of payroll costs. And it contains up to $10 million. 75% of the uh, money has to be used for these payrolls. Otherwise, the money will, uh, be have to, will have to be paid back in full. Um, you have to maintain staffing level and wage counts. You can't let the wages decrease by more than 25% or else you would also have to pay back the money in full. So the adversities that I had to deal with during this project, um, was getting in touch with the general manager for the Yard Goats. Uh, I sent out an email to him hoping to schedule some type of interview, um, whether that was just me asking him questions or talking to him in person. Uh, and thankfully he did respond back. Um, so I'm thankful for that. Um, 
that uh, was a main part of this project. So having him answer was a big help and I kind of connected all the pieces for me. Um, another adversity was to uh, find time to catch up on all of my work on top of baseball. Um, so right around the time that uh, I started this project, baseball was also starting up and I had practiced pretty much every day. Um, I had to figure out how to schedule meetings with my mentor uh, and balance my time spent on this towards this project, baseball and my schoolwork. Um, I'm thankful that I encountered this adversity because it's really going to help me uh, in the future when I get overloaded with work. Also, my goal is to play baseball in college. Uh, so balancing that and all my schoolwork will be challenging, but I'm hoping to take my time management skills developed by this project over with me. So wrapping things up, um, what I took away from this project is that I want to work um, in my business. So when or if something happens again, like uh, this pandemic, my staff members won't have to struggle through it. Uh, I will apply the solutions I've conceived to make their lives easier and keep my business thriving. Um, I could use this project to help me get into college. I'm thinking about majoring in business of some sort. Um, additionally, I could potentially reach out to Mike Abramson, the general manager of the Yard Goats again, for an internship in the future, which could help me get to know what it's like running a baseball organization. Um, and that's about it. So thank you for um, thank you for listening to my capstone project, and I hope you enjoyed. Thank you, Max. If you'll stop sharing your screen, I'd like to follow up with a couple of questions before we let you go. Um, how do I stop? Oh, wait, there we go. Yeah, you got it? Yeah, I got it. Thank you. So it was interesting to me, some of the salary uh, information that you discovered in your research, uh, in particular, that some of the highest pay that some of the players got was actually during COVID because they sort of guaranteed them a flat rate per week of $400. Um, so I was just curious for you as the researcher, um, what was one of the most surprising things that you found out through this research process? Um, well, definitely that stat that, um, it, uh, that $400 a week was an increase for 70% of the players' contracts. Um, that was one of the biggest stats for me, and I was kind of dumbfounded by that, that they're like pro literally professional players, and they, um, they don't really get paid that much, uh, as, as I would think. So do you have, um... It was interesting also that you, you know, discovered certain players on different, you know, one of the rain, I guess one of the Texas Rangers and then um, a couple of other players from different teams who, do it sounded like you were saying they donated part of their salary to help support the players in the farm teams. Um, would you say that was relatively rare? It sounded like it might be. Um. Yeah, it, it, it was partly rare. Some, most of the players are actually generous and most of them, most of the players in the MLB currently are like, um, they, they, they can relate to the minor league player struggles, uh, especially because now their struggles are kind of like enhanced because they didn't even have a season last year and they had no kind of, no money that was coming into them. So um, more players really stepped up and donated. Um, so but it is, it's not as common as I think it should be. I think players should step up more. They have a lot of money and they're getting paid a lot. So, yeah. I guess it's tough though, once you get to that level of play, you know, because I'm assuming most of the major league players, if they've, they're brought up through the farm teams, you know, they probably feel like they put in their time, right? And now yeah. they're in the major league and, it, that's got to be tough to, you know, the psychology of that to, and as a business person, um, did you find any, did you find yourself feeling conflicted about that? Because obviously the point of business is typically to make profit, right? Uh, I mean, yeah, sort of. Uh, I, don't, I don't really have too many comments on that. Okay. 
Well, um, I really enjoyed your presentation. I thought you did a tremendous amount of research into it and it was, um, I'm glad the yard goats made it through. I mean, they're, they've probably been one of the most successful uh, minor league teams that I know of in Connecticut. So yeah, um, it sounds like it was a tough year for them though. Yeah, I love going to their uh, ballpark. So uh, it's good to see them that they uh, kind of survived through this whole thing. Yeah, and I haven't been to the new stadium other than drive past the outside of it. I went to their uh, older one a few times. So I'm kind of thinking now I need to go check out a game. <laughs> yeah, it's great. I've been to one. It's, it was really a lot of fun. All right, I'm going to let you go, Max. Thank you so much. I really appreciated the time and energy that you put into your presentation. All right, thank you. Okay, next up at 4.30, we have Zach Neese, who's presenting on digital technologies, neurological effects on the adolescent brain. All right. Good afternoon. My name is Zachary Neese, and I'm a sophomore at Gilbert High School. This afternoon, I will be talking about the effects of digital technology on the adolescent brain. I'd like to start our off by introducing the topic of digital technology in the brain. The average teen spends nine hours a day in front of screens. However, have you ever wondered how your phone affects your health? Or maybe you may have wondered what staring at a computer for nine hours does to your brain. Maybe you even, even thought about how good the blue light filter is on your devices or why blue light matters anyway. I'm certain many of you have thought about at least one of these things, which is why I chose this topic. Not many people know the real answers to these questions, even though this is a topic that is important to everyone's health. Before I get into the details about my project and everything that I learned, there's one thing that really stood out to me in every single article, experimental document, and scientific journal. We don't understand enough about the brain to really draw major conclusions about what digital technology does to the brain. That being said, there really hasn't been enough research and time to see the full long-term effects of digital technology on the brain. Be sure to keep that in mind as I go through my presentation. I'd now like to go into some original uh, predictions that I had for my project. Uh, when I started off the project, I thought that there would be a lot of research done on this topic in general, and also that scientists would understand the brain more. I also thought that there would be more guidelines around digital technology use, which I'll get into later, and also that there would be physical changes uh, to the brain and because of excessive technology use. So what I found actually surprised me a lot. So now I'm gonna go into some things, uh, or now I'm gonna go into this main question that I found a lot in um, some articles on the internet, which was, can technology rewire the adolescent brain? Even though there might not be major things that scientists can conclude about possible dangers of digital technology, there's one thing that's apparent. As some of you might fear or might have heard in the news, there's this idea that digital technology or screens can rewire the brain after constant use. This is a half truth. The false part being that the brain can't be rewired in the sense that you might think. Most articles and reports from the media go into much detail about how technology rots your brain out or causes you to be dumb, which is false. The truth is that the brain can be changed, but not in the way they say. The brain grows, learns, and is shaped around the experiences you have in your childhood from the second you are born through the 25 years of age. During these years of growth and rapid development, the brain has considerable plasticity and is extremely malleable, especially in the hippocampus, which is the main area for learning and memory. During the first three years of life, a child's brain creates over 1 million new con connections per second, which is an essential process for development of various functions. These connections create a foundation for higher order functions such as decision-making. This is why we, the use of digital technology with infants can be dangerous, but will not rewire the brain. Although adolescents have more developed brain than an infant, that doesn't mean that they are protected from the effects of digital technology on the brain. So what does digital technology really do to the brain? Now I'm gonna go into some proven harmful effects that I found from my research um, on, of digital technology on the adolescent brain. One proven harmful effect of digital technology on the adolescent brain is a high risk of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, otherwise known as ADHD. Before I go into the details, I want to say that this does not mean a child will develop ADHD after using digital technology. In a 2014 meta-analysis, 
there is a strong correlation between the extensive use of screen time and ADHD. If a child already has ADHD, the extensive screen use can only make symptoms worse. Relating back to brain plasticity, this makes sense. Another more recent survey also indicated a significant association between more frequent use of digital technology with the adolescents having no symptoms at the start of the survey and showed many symptoms of ADHD in a 24 month follow-up. Because of the brain's plasticity, extensive screen use becomes a habit for some people, especially when used for long periods of time at such a young age. Relating to the image on the screen, a PET scan of two brains, one being of a person without ADHD and one of a person with ADHD. As you might be able to tell, there's a large difference in the activity levels of each brain. In the scan, the red section indicates a more active area of the brain, while the blue and green sections indicate a less active area of the brain. This image clearly shows how much of a change and difference there is in the brain with ADHD versus a brain without ADHD. The direct cause of ADHD through digital technology use hasn't been fully agreed on by neurologists, although most agree that it could be caused by multitasking with screens at an early age, which impairs executive functioning. One frequently asked question I've noticed in general is can you get addicted to using digital technology? The truth is, yes, you can get addicted and this makes technology addiction really dangerous. To have technology addiction, you must be an extreme technology user, which is defined by using technology more than six hours per day. Along with this, like any addiction, you must have a need to be using technology or relate back to technology a lot of the time. Now that you know about how the brain works, this also makes sense. As adolescents grow up using technology, their brain develops relating back to it, especially since digital technology is used frequently starting in elementary school. As these adolescents grow up, they begin to spend more and more time on the computer, not only in school, but outside of school to do homework or other things. Along with this, students begin to get phones and other electronics devices, sometimes as early as 12 years old, which adds another device that is only one pocket reach away. By using these devices at such a young age, so frequently, adolescents' brains get used to using digital technology as one of their early on foundations in the brain circuits, causing more frequent need to be using digital technology for simple tasks that adolescents would otherwise not need digital technology for. Technology addiction is a very complicated problem and only one effect of many on the brain from digital technology. This is something that scientists are still researching, which is why there isn't much information about it and how harmful it really is to the adolescent brain. But it's still important to remember that it is possible to become addicted to digital technology. As many of us have experienced in the last year due to COVID, we were quite isolated. Although with COVID, digital technology was able to help us around social isolation. In other times, for example, before COVID, social isolation of because of digital technology was and still is a big problem in adolescence. As of 2017, 90% of teens were using social media daily. And this number has only increased since. You might be thinking, well, has this caused so social isolation if so many people are using social media daily? The answer is that this is a paradox since ex excessive uh, social media use has been linked to social isolation. As people spend more time on social media, they tend to spend less time around other people in person. This relates to more, sp more time spent using digital technology for entertainment rather than schoolwork, although this could be pertinent to both. In a study of 1,787 young adults, ages 19 to 32, scientists found that using social media two or more hours each day doubled the odds for perceived social isolation compared with using social media less than 30 minutes each day. This makes sense because young adults and teens have the tendency to make upward social comparisons based on highly curated social media feeds. This can take a large toll on the brain because with minimal social interactions at a young age, builds that foundation in the brain to be shy and extremely introverted. As most of you know, using digital technology affects sleep the most out of anything we know so far. Yet it's not using screens during the day that affects sleep. It's using them right before you go to sleep. Screen exposure disrupts sleep, negatively affecting cognition and behavior. In a recent study of infant and toddlers, we, it was found that touchscreen use negatively impacted sleep onset, sleep duration, and nighttime awakening. Along with this, in adolescents, more time using smartphones before sleep was associated with greater sleep disturbances. Also, in adults, smartphone use before sleep was associated with shorter sleep duration and less efficient sleep. So what does this mean for the brain? 
Well, poor sleep quality was found to be associated with brain changes, such as reduced functional connectivity and decreased gray matter volume. Along with this, it is also associated with increased risk for age-associated cognitive impairments and Alzheimer's disease. This gets much more complicated though, as the direct effect of digital technology is on the eyes. The unnatural light of the screen used before bed, usually in the dark, messes with your body's circadian rhythm. The circadian rhythm is the human's body clock and is dependent on an internal clock located in part of the anterior hypothalamus called the suprachiasmic nucleus, or SCN for short. As you can see on, in, in this image on the right, the hypothalamus is located at the base of the brain. And also, as you can see, this is a small part of the hypothalamus. Uh, the anterior hypothalamus is where the SCN is located. The SCN is connected to the retina, which causes it to be sensitive to light. Light plays a major role in adjusting and synchronizing the body's clock. Because of this, uh, the use of screen at night, it becomes extremely difficult for many to initiate sleep, as well as their circadian rhythm is changed and the SEN is exposed to unnatural light. Now I'm going to go into some important and interesting things to remember that I learned while researching for this project. One thing that has a major impact on brain activity and is not often thought about is the quality of things that you're watching and what you're specifically using digital technology for. The biggest difference is between educational videos or shows versus shows that you watch for entertainment. This is mainly evident in preschoolers watching shows like Sesame Street. After watching Sesame Street on a regular basis, it was found that these preschoolers had greater levels of school readiness as well as superior language development. Along with this, neural responses in a region of the brain associated with mathematic abilities have been recorded as higher in numerical versus non-numerical segments of Sesame Street. This shows that these TV shows actually have more of a benefit on the brain than we might think. This alone proves how complex the brain really is and how complicated research on the brain is. This is because everything you do on digital technology can give different effects on the brain and where the brain is most active. Along with the idea of educational television and how it affects children's brain, it has also been recommended that parents engage in co-viewing while watching television or doing other activities. This may increase infant attention on content, yet doesn't really have any cognitive outcomes associated with it. Although some cross-sectional studies suggest that daily television watching, reading, and physical activity when done with a caregiver is associated with higher linguistic and or cognitive development than in children who engage in these activities once or twice per week, even though it isn't fully proven, it seems pretty clear that co-viewing has a positive effect on an infant's development, which makes it worthwhile to take part in. Throughout my research, I was particularly surprised to see the benefits that digital technology provides on the brain. For example, digital technology stimulates decision-making and complex reasoning circuits in the brain, or can help with language development or even memory or and spatial skills. So even as there are some clear effects of digital technology on the brain, there are also so many benefits that really give that really prove to you how complex the brain is. The one benefit that really stood out to me was neural activity. Before I started this project, I didn't realize that the brain can really be improved through neural activity. Neural activity can basically be anything that stimulates the circuits inside the brain or something that brings new experiences and, and or information causing your brain to learn new things. For example, Text reading on a screen activates brain regions controlling language, reading, memory, and visual abilities. Just simple activities like doing web search online can also stimulate your brain. This is extremely beneficial for information that could help scientists understand the development of the brain later in later adolescent years with digital technology. After looking at many of the bad effects of digital technology on the brain, I thought it would be helpful to show some screen time recommendations. On an average day of school, I spend around 12 hours either on my computer, phone, or tablet. Most of this time, I either get from doing work on the computer in school or doing homework on my computer at home. This definitely does take a toll on our brains, which is why it's important to look at what the real recommendations for screen time are. Here on the screen, I have some recommendations from the American Association of Pediatrics, also known as the AAP, but these guidelines are very minimal for screen use. They recommend the avoidance of screens for children under 18 months. For children up to the age of five, they recommend a limit of one hour per day of high quality programming. The AAP still does not have any specific guidelines on how much screen time is healthy for teens, 
Although they do state that adolescents should try to keep a balance between screen time and physical activity. So basically after the age of five, the main rule of thumb is to spend as little time as you can on screens. Although there aren't many specific guidelines for everyone, the AAP has some uh, general guidelines that people can use. Some of these would be turn off screens when not in use, turn off screens an hour before you go to sleep to destimulate the brain, and also don't sleep with any unnecessary screens or devices near your head. One thing that I think is very important for me to cover this afternoon is the topic of cancer and cell phones. This is yet another topic that may, many don't fully understand or think about, yet could be extremely important to your health. The debate over risks of radiation exposure has become extremely prominent, although data in adults tend to show weak or non-causal links between radiofrequency exposure and brain cancer in diff and different head tumors. Some evidence suggests higher risks of certain cancers, for example, glioma, a cancer of glial cells in the brain or spine, has increased due to mo mobile phone use, especially on the side of the head that is preferred for phone calls. As the profilation of mobile phone use, especially in children, is a relatively recent phenomenon, the long-term health risks in this group are not clear, and there have been no previous generation exposed uh, during childhood or adolescence to this kind of radiation. So the general answer to this question is that scientists don't really know the, if, if cell phones cause cancer in adolescents. So now I'd like to go into some things that really need to be researched or things that uh, science has not proven yet. A few things that I found um, from my research was that we need more research on the um, brain cancer and cell phone use, as I was just talking about, and or other Bluetooth devices used near the head, as uh, many of us use AirPods or other um, Bluetooth earbuds, and of course our phones near our brains, which could cause, um, we don't know what it causes, and there is a small um, linkage between uh, cancer and these devices. So it would be very um, important for us to research that as that could really affect our health. Along with this, we need to look at how screen stacking or screen multitasking affects the brain, because this is something that has a um, link to causing ADHD symptoms in um, adolescents. A few other things that need to be researched would be how the brain is changed in early years from digital technology use, um, because there haven't been many generations that have uh, grown up using digital technology, which is why this is a relatively new topic, yet it still needs to be covered so that we can make some um, strong guidelines for uh, adolescents and infants and toddlers as they grow up. Um, of the last two things that I have that I think really need to be researched would be blue light and the re reliability of blue light filters on our devices, as we still don't know a lot about blue light and how it affects the brain. Um, we know that it stimulates the brain, but there isn't much information on how reliable the blue light filters are on our devices, uh, which again is very important to the brain and how it stimulates the brain. The last thing is how longer daily screen times affect the brain, which um, is very important because we know that screen times do affect the brain, but we don't know if a longer screen time would have more damage on the brain rather than a shorter screen time. Overall, one of the biggest things that I got out of this project was that we are all spending way too much time on digital technology, yet we aren't thinking twice about it. We aren't thinking about what these devices are doing or not doing to us, more specifically our eyes and of course our brains. Therefore, it is important that we spend more time researching and learning about the brain and the effects, of digital tech, the effects digital technology has on it. Thank you for listening. I hope you all enjoyed my presentation. I'd now like to open up the floor to, for any questions you may have about my project. Thank you so much, Zachary. Um, if you don't mind, stop sharing your screen and we'll do a little Q&A. <clears throat> um, I'm going to pause here and give some of the listeners the opportunity to either put a question in the chat or you can unmute your mic and uh, pose a question to Zachary directly. So while people are thinking, Zachary, um, one of the things I was curious about is um, you touched on it a couple of times. You talked about uh, blue light and blue light filters. So I was just curious about, um, there's a number of people, um, and I know this wasn't the focus of your research, but I'm just curious if you came across it at all. There's a number of people that I know um, 
who are prone to migraine headaches, who in the pandemic world we've been living in have had to uh, try to, to change the filter on their computers or uh, because they, you know, the nature of their jobs didn't allow them to reduce their screen time. So they had to kind of come up with alternate ways to maybe avoid getting a migraine headache. So I was just curious if you would come across any information in your research about that topic um, and what your thinking was about that. So I didn't find any much about that um, in my research. Uh, it still is a topic that hasn't gotten enough attention or the attention that it really needs uh, just because it's, it's relatively new and humans, of course, we're not uh, really used to spending so much time on the screen. So it, it makes sense that many people do get headaches or migraines um, from using screens a lot. And I do myself, and that is due to blue light. Um, and the effect on the brain. And I guess my other question I have is, um, you know, you clearly have a keen interest in neuroscience, or at least it seems so from this project. Um, how do you, do you have any goals toward that in the future? Or is this just sort of a side interest that you wanted to delve into? Uh, actually, this, this is something that I want to go into in the future. Uh, I want to become a neurosurgeon and I plan on um, majoring in neuroscience in college. Um, so this is definitely something that's kind of like right up my alley, something that I've always kind of been looking forward to researching and learning about. Um, so I, I definitely enjoyed this project and it was, it was really fun to kind of learn something that maybe was a little bit of a side um, part of neuroscience, but it was still very interesting. I was able to learn a lot about the brain and the functions of the brain. Yeah, and I think a lot of the current research that's coming out is about that idea of the plasticity of the brain. I think in older research, you know, and I might have my dates wrong, so correct me if I'm way off base here, but I think some of the older research in the 1990s and 1980s was more about, you know, the idea of the analogy of the brain being like a computer, right? And now there, it seems like the research is shifting and they're realizing that um, the pathways in the brain can be redirected. Um, and you, again, you touched on that a little bit in your presentation. Do you want to say a little bit more about that and what you learned about it? Um, just in, in general about brain plasticity, uh, which I found is very fascinating. There's a lot of information about it that's coming out, as you were saying. Um, and it is a big deal because many people don't really understand that brain plasticity is a um, actual big deal for for um, infants especially because uh, it, when you're growing up your brain is developing and changing based on the events that and the experiences that you have in your life and that's that's the main thing that uh, scientists have found out recently is that your brain is actually changing based on the events that you and the experiences that you have rather than um, just as you grow up it will develop more it's really mainly focused on uh, the events and experiences that you go through, um, which really shape and give you a foundation of the brain circuits, which makes the brain so complex because everyone's is really different because we all have different experiences. So I'm going to pause again here for a second and see if anyone thought of a question they'd like to ask. Um, I have a question. Um, Zachary, that was a great uh, presentation. One of the questions that I have uh, relates to, you said the total amount of time was um, potentially an issue. Was there any research on like breaking up the amount of time so that you have breaks in between? Could that potentially uh, help or uh, limit the impact on the brain? Did you find anything about that? So there wasn't much research on that topic itself, um, but I think that uh, spending time in between um, using digital technology or just screens in general um, does does help. And I think that it's good to take breaks in between because spending more time uh, probably uh, tires out your brain and your eyes especially, um, which causes you to have headaches and things like that. So there wasn't much research on it, but um, I think that uh, taking breaks is a good idea. Hi, Zach. <laughs> Um, my question was, um, did any of this research seem to be conducted during the pandemic or is everything just too new at this point? 
So there was actually one um, research, one uh, scientific journal that I found, uh, which was the first resource that I found. Um, and that was actually published in 2020, um, in June of 2020. So during the, during the pandemic, uh, which was really interesting. Um, and I'm pretty sure it was from UCLA. Um, I, don't quote me on that, but I think it was. And um, that one was the uh, kind of resource that I had a lot of information on about brain plasticity, which is why I was saying it's such a new topic because that was literally last year that it came out, so. Thank you. You mentioned being surprised several times. What was the most surprising to you? Um, in general, I, I so as I mentioned in the beginning, I thought that there was going to be some sort of uh, visual change to the brain that I was going to find, um, mainly because I didn't really know much about the brain. When I started the project, I actually started with some background research just to learn, like, hey, I need to learn what each part of the brain does, because maybe there's going to be a part that's most affected, and they're going to be talking about the brain, of course, in, in the research, and I need to know what they're talking about. So after re doing background research and really learning about the brain and how it functions, how it works, it was kind of obvious that there wouldn't be a physical change. Uh, and I, I think that's it, it, there really won't be a physical change in future, like long-term effects. But I'd say that was the most surprising to me just because I didn't really know much about the brain going into the project. I was surprised that, oh, there's not gonna be a physical change to the brain. I thought that would be something that you would be able to visually see um, due to digital technology use. All right, I neglected to say this at the end of the last presentation, but um, just make sure that your work cited um, slides are uh, given to you, Ms. McDonald. Um, I know that's part of the project and I really enjoyed your presentation. I will pause one more time just to see if anyone else has a last question that they'd like to ask or comment to make. All right. Um, thank you so much. And I'm going to, we're, we're a little running a little bit early. I think the next one is Michael Neese, uh, who will be presenting Designing a More Consistent Renewable Energy Harvester. Um, so I'm going to let him get set up. And um, we have about four minutes before the next one begins. Okay, Michael, we are ready whenever you are ready to begin. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Michael Neese, and for the past year, I have been working to design a new renewable energy system that is more efficient in producing energy and is not solely dependent on a given day's weather. And so in recent decades, uh, human activity has caused significant carbon, build up, carbon dioxide buildup in our atmosphere and is negatively impacting Earth's climate. Renewable technology such as solar panels, wind turbines, and hydroelectric dams have been developed to minimize our carbon footprint. However, current clean energy harvesters all have common deficiencies. They all are dependent on weather conditions and are unreliable. For example, solar depends heavily on the sun including if it's visible, uh, when it rises, when it sets, and when it's at its optimal position, as well as the maintenance for snow and other objects that could block the panels. On the other hand, wind turbines aren't as dependent, but they, uh, they, are, they are in fact dependent on a part of weather that isn't as consistent, which is wind. And finally, dams, which are proven to generate the most amount of electricity uh, and aren't entirely dependent on the sun or any other weather component. Uh, uh, they are dependent uh, on the sun and the water cycle. So uh, even though they aren't entirely dependent uh, on the sun and other weather components, uh, don't let that fool you. Their weakness is severe storms. Uh, they're really dependent on the water cycle. Um, they require a change in landscape, large areas, uh, they're a hazard to nearby towns. Uh, they have a risk in major floods um, and their maintenance uh, is super uh, big. They have their high cost and their effect on the wildlife is enormous. 
Uh, this is not the only problem with these standard existing harvesters. They also take up so much space and most of the time they destroy the environment around them. So for example, dams change where their water lays, uh, changing like a river into a lake and solar, solar farms require a large amount of land. Uh, in the, if the environment is what we are seeking to save, then why, uh, then we need to figure out a better solution that does not affect it. So with this question on where else in my head, I turn toward the ocean. The ocean has a lot of potential for future development of renewable technology to provide the world with sufficient electricity. However, it is widely under-researched and harvesters are underdeveloped. 69% of Earth's surface is oceans, yet we haven't come up with a sustainable harvester to do the heavy lifting production of energy uh, while we build and industrialize on the 29% of Earth's surface that is land. So after re researching and comparing each existing harvesting system, I designed a solution, the coral reef. Um, my renewable energy harvesting system is a, is a development of existing harvesters integrated into one, taking the best concepts and applying them to an ocean-based system um, so that now you might be wondering what makes this so much better. Well, let me walk you through uh, what I have learned throughout my research. So solar energy, unlike other renewable technology, has two variations, solar photovoltaic, uh, PV, and uh, sent, uh, concentrating solar power, which is CSP. So solar PV and solar CS, uh, CSP are vastly different and utilize different aspects of the sun. PV cells convert the sun's light directly into energy, while CSP cells uh, use the sun's energy, converting uh, converting to high temperature heat, which is then used to drive uh, to drive an electric generator. So, due to CSP's indirect route in producing electricity with the heat, um, it 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 has um, not been as widely integrated. So, the major benefit to solar, uh, the main reason they are one of the most widely used systems is that they have virtually no footprint due to their ability to lay, uh, to lay out on a roof or a tower. Uh, this means they have no impact on the environments they are, uh, they, that they are placed in. So uh, solar's limitations, however, vary by day, season, uh, setup and orientation, and the time of day. So solar, uh, solar power production can range from 250 to 400 watts. However, since there is roughly 12 hours of daylight in one day, it is not generating electricity for 50% of the day. So this brings up a setback to the global goal of being 100% renewable technology uh, be, because it will limit the energy consumption uh, to only during the day and not the night, assuming that it's only a solar grid. Wind turbines are known to be as dependent on weather conditions as solar because of its reliance on the wind. Turbines begin to produce energy at wind speeds of at least six to nine miles per hour and only operate at around 30% to 40% efficiency throughout an average day. The reason for this low percent of efficiency in energy production is because there is a lot of resistance caused by the friction between the high speed shaft and the generator, which creates the, which creates the kinetic energy to make energy. Um, and so this kinetic energy is converted into electrical energy, which can then be put into the grid and utilized. As wind harvesters are being developed and improved, there is no foreseeable solution uh, to the problem of the size and its impact on the environment. The installation of wind tur turbines requires enormous machinery, which results in the destruction of land around it due to its big size and height. However, it requires light main maintenance and has a decent lifespan of 20 years. Now, hydroelectric dams function similar to wind turbines, where a shaft is spun to create kinetic energy, which is then converted into electricity. However, the main difference between both systems is their structure and dependency. Hydroelectric dams are enormous structures usually made out of cement that hold water at a high level and then use forward force caused by gravity to, to divert the water into a chamber where the turbine is then turned and the water is released at a lower level. Hydropower as a whole, dams, rivers, etc., was the largest generator of renewable energy up until, the few, up until a few years ago in 2019 being responsible for 3% of electricity uh, generation. As mentioned previously, hydroelectric dams are dependent on the water cycle and the amount of precipitation plus the level of existing uh, water available. If water levels are lower uh, than, than the penstock, water will not reach the turbine, stopping the production. 
Although it is unlikely that the water cycle majorly affects the dams, they are still massive projects to carry out and require a great amount of machinery to construct. Affecting the environment tremendously, however, once built, hydroelectric dams can last up to 200 years in pr producing energy for people to use. So with my analysis of each common harvester, solar panels, wind turbines, and hydroelectric dams, I rank them out of five. So on my scale, solar panels received a three, wind turbines a two, and then hydroelectric dams received a four. Now, uh, it was time for me to assess my problem, which was what would a five look like? So I compared their cost per watt, production rate, and consistency of each harvester, as, as well as their environmental impact, footprint, and lifespan. There are many pros and cons to each harvesting method, some being more dependent and others having a small impact on the environment, which factors which factors are more important though? So as some can argue, the price is the most important factor to an effective harvester to be more profitable, um, but uh, it is truly the impact on the environment that is the most important because the aim of renewable energy is to preserve the environment from damage of climate change, not um, a profit. And so as can be, cons as can be inferred, the colors represent uh, how they compare to each other. So green being better and red being worse. Solar panels are red for their dependency because they only generate electricity during the day. And on top of that, depend on how clear the sky is. But it is green under sustainability column because of its small footprint and little to no direct impact on the environment, which is very important. It is crucial to note the ocean and hydropower harvester systems have more extensive lifespans, uh, which gives them uh, uh, giving them more time to surpass the energy it took to construct. So as I finalized my research uh, and formed this chart, I compared each harvester's st uh, statistics and found that an average 10 kilowatt solar panel system costs $20,000 and has the smallest footprint. On the other hand, wind turbines have a capacity of 2,000 to 3,000 kilowatts and cost 2.6 to $4 million. Although wind turbines are cheaper per kilowatt and have an extensive lifespan, its energy conversion efficiency is only 30 to 40% during an average day. While solar panels work at 100% efficiency for at least five hours on a sunny day. Wind turbines are almost never working at 100%. And then hydroelectric dams stood out to be the most consistent energy harvesters producing 1,000 to 10,000 kilowatts. Uh, their cost soaring is high as 4,500 per kilowatt. Though an important thing to keep in mind uh, with hydroelectric dams is that in order to construct them, it is an enormous impact on the environment. Before I started drawing my design, I looked deeper into the newly developed wave power generators that I found in my research. And one of which was the uh, power buoy that you see on the board um, that was developed by Ocean Power Technologies. Um, this new idea stood out to me because it was small, compact, and the first design that incorporated a simple ball screw mechanic. However, it still was in the process of testing, so we don't know how accurate or how successful it is. After comparing each harvesting system, I chose to use a wave power generator along with solar panels uh, since they were the most efficient per dollar and had a small footprint. After developing many computer-aided designs, my final design is a multi-harvester system called the Coral Reef. The Coral Reef is a development of existing harvesters integrated into one, taking the best concepts and applying them to an ocean-based system. With wave production being fairly constant, and tracking solar panels, this system utilizes space it occupies and is always producing electricity due to its dual components. What makes my coral reef so effective is its small size compared to the ocean and its minimal impact on the environment. The coral reef takes up an area of 47.5 feet by 54 feet, almost half the size of an average dam. Even though it produces only an estimated uh, 325 kilowatt hours of electricity in that amount of space, it does not require on-site construction and does not uh, change the landscape of the environment as dams build up uh, an enormous body of water on the other on the higher side. Another aspect that is advantageous to the coral reef uh, is that it does not put people at risk. Dams hold back lo loads of water, and if there were to be an error in the construction or a change in weather patterns causing heavy rainfall, uh, they could break and cause major uh, flooding and casualties. So to allow this presentation to run smoothly uh, I, and avoid the risk of my CAD model not loading, I'm going to show you a 
video that will give you a tour around my CAD, uh, CAD model of the coral reef. The coral reef energy harvester is a buoy system that can float in the ocean. It is a dual harvesting system which consists of three power buoys by Ocean Power Technologies and three solar panels. Each power buoy moves up and down as they follow the wave crests and troughs on the surface of the water. The vertical movement of the buoy moves a shaft which has a ball screw at the end of it. The ball screw turns a rotating drive shaft which turns the generator and produces electricity. Each solar panel network has the ability to track and point toward the optimal angle of the sun. This rotation and tilting of the solar panels are achieved with light sensors and motors, the main support fixed to a turntable. The electricity generated is stored in batteries located in the central structure, which is then transported to a facility to enter into the grid. The coral reef. So as I was initially developing my design, I wanted to develop the mechanics of the solar panel to aim for 10 hours of direct sunlight per day instead of five. So my immediate thought was, what if solar panels could track the sun to produce energy at an optimal input angle? And as expected, the solar panels with the tracking axis produced more energy as well as for a longer period of, uh, period of the day. Well, non-tracking panels started producing energy around five in the morning until six in the afternoon, Tracking panels extended the time frame from three hours or by three hours, ranging from as early as four in the morning to as late as eight at night. Also throughout the day, a tracking panel has a wider peak in the middle of the day, meaning that it, uh, it is utilizing the sun's light at, at maximum capacity, capacity for longer. This difference is extremely important as a tracking panel is producing about 1.3% more energy than a panel without, track, uh, without a tracker. So to see if this actually worked, I ran some tests with a small solar panel and a power bank. As you can see, when the solar panel was static, it, pro it, uh, it progressed by one to 2% per hour and rarely reached an hourly change of 3%. When I moved it uh, every hour, um, it started pro uh, progressing by two to 3% per hour and rarely only achieved 1% uh, as an hourly change. Just from adjusting the position of the solar panel, I was able to stretch the energy production three more hours and 8% uh, on the battery of my power bank. And uh, right here, you can see the data. Uh, it matches uh, the data that uh, one, of, one of my researching sites uh, showed me. And so that's how I knew uh, that this was a good method to incorporate on my harvester. My design includes solar panels that can collect 100 kilowatt hours per day each. And on top of that, each power buoy is capable of producing 8.4 kilowatt hours on an average day. The whole system producing a total of about 325 kilowatt hours per day. The electricity generated is stored in the batteries located in the central structure, which is then transported to a facility to enter into the grid. There are currently two proposals for transporting the electricity that I have. And so the first one is a remotely operated underwater vehicle or an ROV that plugs into the central structure and is on a constant cycle of three ROVs. One plugged into the harvester, the second at the electricity facility, and the last one on its way back to replace the first ROV. The second possibility for transporting the electricity produced in a, is a simple cable leading from the bottom of the central structure directly to the unloading facility. As this would disrupt ocean life, this would not be the best choice. My multi-harvesting system, uh, the Core Reef, consists of a dual action between wave-powered generators and sun-tracking solar panels. As I said before, it produces an estimated 325 kilowatt hours of electricity per day, aiming for 10 hours of direct sunlight instead of five hours of a fixed solar panel. The Coral Reef is a more, is a more efficient uh, is more efficient than wind turbines because they depend less on the weather as a result of a dual system, and have a, a smaller impact on the environment. The multi-harvester is more efficient, energy efficient than solar panels alone due to its ability to track and point itself at the optimal angle toward the sun. Even though solar panels can be placed on buildings without any footprint on the environment, alone they cannot sustain the demand for electricity. Not only is the coral reef more efficient than existing solar and wind harvesters, it, is, it also comp competes with hydroelectric dams not needing such a big footprint and not majorly impacting the environment. 
So although the cost for my harvester is unassessed, it still addresses the main components to make an effective and efficient harvesting system. And one, uh, one that is realistic for the world to go 100% renewable on. For a closer look at the mechanics uh, and design of the coral reef, uh, I, will, I will post my CAD design that I created on Onshape in the chat uh, once I finish up the presentation. And so, as I said in the beginning of this presentation, the ocean has a lot of potential for future development on renewable technology to provide the world with sufficient electric electricity. However, it is widely under-researched and harvesters are underdeveloped. 69% of Earth's surface is oceans, yet we haven't come up with a sustainable harvester to do heavy lifting production of energy while we build and industrialize on land. There is limited space on land and we shouldn't be focusing on harvesters that will limit us for, uh, from growth. It is time to start investing in the ocean. I would like to thank you all for listening to my presentation on this project, Improving and Designing Renewable Technology. I have been working on it uh, for a while now and I'm, I'm really excited uh, with the end result. But before we go into Q&A, uh, part of this presentation, for part of this presentation, I would first like to recognize my advisor, Dr. Carlson, who teaches at GHS, and my mentor, Mr. Page, who is one of the mentors for the robotics team, uh, because they helped me uh, by guiding me through the engineering process and starting with a problem and ending with a working solution. And it, they also assisted me when problems arose and I would really like to thank them both. Uh, they were such a tremendous help in developing this end product. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, I love the use of the engineering de design process in your presentation. That was really cool. Um, and obviously, Dr. Carlson uh, has taught you well, at least in that respect. Um, so I will start off with a softball question, and then I'm going to open it up to others to ask you some, some maybe more intensive questions. Um, I, am I correct to assume that you have an interest, a long-term interest in engineering then? Yes. Any specific area that you're thinking of or are you still exploring? I'm still exploring. Um, I, I initially started out looking to be uh, uh, a mechanical engineer and then I kind of started uh, getting into some coding and then I don't know where I'm going to go now. Uh, so playing it as I go. Yeah, no, and I think exploration is a good thing. I mean, that's probably one of the best things about being in high school is you have you have that luxury of being able to sort of explore and, and you know, hone, and, and you don't even have to necessarily have a final decision made when you graduate high school. Sometimes, you know, people explore a little bit further into their first or second year of college. So I'm going to pause here and see if anyone else who's in the audience has a question they'd like to put in the chat, or you can unmute your mic and ask Michael directly. Hi, Michael. I have a question. Uh, but first, a comment. That was an amazing presentation. I really love it. Um, my question was just about the batteries again and retrieving the power, the ROVs. How do they, when they go out, how do they get the electricity? Are they exchanging batteries or? Yes, yeah, so. I just didn't quite get that. Yeah, so it's like a, um, it's like a regular power bank. Uh, it would sort of be something like that where it has, the ROV has a battery in it and it's kind of just plugging in, um, taking the energy from the harvester and then uh, driving over to the facility to enter into the grid. Okay, very nice, thank you. Other questions from the audience or that you want to put into the chat? I have a question. Uh, first of all, Michael, that was a great presentation. Thank you for doing that. Um, you mentioned that the name of your harvester is called the Coral Reef. Could there be any uh, additional design improvements to make um, it more habitable for marine wildlife or something like that? Have you thought about that? Yes. So. Um, my coral reef, um, it's called the coral reef because um, it's supposed to act as a natural um, reef for uh, the wildlife to live in. Um, so it's not, so it's kind of like contributing to have a home for um, little fish or little um, things in the water, uh, in the ocean. Uh, and one of the things that it would need improve, improving on is the support buoys on the sides that have the, um, 
the large supports to hold the central structure up. And uh, that would be a place where it needs improving um, upon uh, to be better for the environment. I was a little bit curious about, I know that you had on your slide that the base is um, on, you know, meant to sort of stabilize it so that it would stay buoyed on top of the water. Um, I guess I was curious about the design aspects of stormy versus calm water, how far out, you know, how far out would it have to be? Or because it's a buoy, would it have to be closer to the shore? I was just sort of curious about that. Yeah, so um, the central structure has, uh, if you looked at that image, it had a, um, a big support coming down um, and it was supposed to act as a central weight so that it wouldn't tip. Um, it would kind of stay upright as it supported the power buoys. Um, those were the products by Ocean Power Technologies um, so that those would be functioning and going up and down with the waves. And then uh, how far it should go out. It's 50 feet tall. Um, so it doesn't need to go too far out. Um, it, could, it could be in the sound, uh, not in the sound. It could be outside of the sound, uh, probably that far out. Um, as long as it's 50 feet deep, um, it should work. Um, and then the support buoys can go as far down uh, the wire that holds the support buoys on the edges. There's three. Um, those can go down as, as far as it um, allows. So if I'm hearing you correctly, whether the water is calm or stormy wouldn't necessarily matter then because of how it's structured with the, the you know, it's got sort of an anchoring system to it as well. Yeah, so it's got a really... Um, complex anchoring system that, that really keeps it in place, um, doesn't allow it to drift or do anything. Um, if there were, were to be a huge storm, that would be um, a problem and a risk for the solar panels and the wings is what I call them. And so what you would do then is one solution that I've thought of is you would just sink uh, the entire harvester down uh, a couple, like until it's covering, uh, so it's not sticking out of the ocean surface. Uh, so that when the waves crash, they're not uh, affecting any of the um, any of the uh, electronics. And of course, everything would have to be waterproof if you were to sink that. Um, tell us about your previous experience using CAD. Is this something new to you, or is this something that an interest of yours that you've developed over a longer period of time? Yeah. So this has been. Um, a real big interest uh, that I have had. Um, I started out with Mr. Page, uh, my mentor, he's on here right now. Um, he was going through lessons with us, teaching us and the, our robotics team uh, last, last fall. Um, that was my first year on the robotics team. And then we were kind of adapting to a new system called Onshape and that's uh, a web browser, uh, web-based um, software that you can have on any computer. It doesn't require a download. And so what I did was I just kept on going through um, the, the videos that they provided and, you know, just like trial and error. And that's how I kind of developed this. This isn't my first time with CAD. Um, I've done a couple uh, big scale projects uh, with CAD. And then uh, this is like my third biggest project uh, with CAD now. And so I've really developed the skill uh, to make these functioning products. Other questions or comments? All right, Michael, we uh, really enjoyed your presentation and definitely gave a lot of food for thought in terms of, you know, the, the, the thing that was most striking to me was if you're not looking at profitability and you're looking at actually the goal of a renewable energy source, it's interesting to see that graph in particular was very fascinating to me in terms of, you know, what are we really trying to accomplish here and what should we be really focused on? Um, so that was, uh, I know that wasn't the focus of what you were trying to say, but it, I, I was really glad you included it in your research because um, it led to a lot more, I think, credibility to your argument about why this alternate coral reef system that has a dual approach to it would be better. So thank you so much. It was really uh, an eye-opening presentation.
Thank you. <clears throat> okay, our final presentation will start at 5.30 and uh, Ethan Clark will be presenting the design and construction of a baseball bat. Uh, so uh, greetings everyone, this is Ethan Clark and he will be presenting on the design and construction of a baseball bat. So Ethan, whenever you're ready to go, you take it away. Okay, thank you. Hello, I am Ethan Clark. This evening I will present my capstone project. Before I get started, I would like to introduce my mentor to provide a direction and encouragement for me throughout my entire effort, my grandfather. Hi, I'm Donald Clark. I am a retired engineer. Throughout my career, I was involved in various aspects of engineering including design, application, sales, and the marketing of engineered products. An engineered product is anything that satisfies the need and specific purpose for which it is intended. Due to Ethan's interest and involvement in baseball, he chose the baseball bat as the engineered product for his capstone project. He researched and found a local company who manufactures baseball bats. This company is Tater Bats, located in Waterbury, Connecticut. Ethan contacted them, discussed his interest, and described the capstone project. They were receptive to becoming involved, which resulted in several visits to their company to learn the details of baseball bat manufacturing, including the material selection, design specification requirements, as well as player selection and preference for specific bats. For this pro project, Ethan will limit his discussion to bats made of wood, which is the requirement for all major and minor league teams. I have here in my hand, uh, I'm not sure that you can see it, is an actual tater bat. This bat was manufactured to Ethan's specifications by Ethan himself in the Tater Manufacturing Facility under their guidance and instruction. It is a beautiful bat, as you hopefully can see. It is uh, outfitted in uh, Guilford Green, Grizzly Green, I believe, and is the, their top of the line signature series bat engraved with Ethan's name. It is a high quality, definitely top of the line bat. Ethan, take it away. Okay, thank you, grandfather. That was a very good job. Right, so, who I am. Hello, my name is Ethan Clark. I'm a junior at Guilford High School. I played baseball for the high school and I love the sport. I have played since I was five years old and it's something that I've always been passionate about. So I've been playing baseball for about 12 years. It's, I'm, it's very fun. It's very relaxing. I just, I like the sport a lot. Throughout my presentation, you will be learning about the history of the baseball bat, the physics of a player's swing, the hardships I faced, and how I created my bat. I am presenting the baseball bat that I made with tater bats. The reason I am interested in creating the bat through engineering is because I might major in engineering when I am in college. Engineering has always interested me because engineers create everything that we use today, as my grandfather previously explained. So the history of the baseball bat. Before the there we go. This is the baseball bat. Before the MLB restrictions and rules of the length and diameter of a baseball bat, people used to create their bat based off their swing. With this process, there were a lot of interesting looking baseball bats. Players used flat or round and short or fat bats. These would create some interesting swings because each bat was different based on the actual player's swing. And um, each bat had different length, diameter, and weight. So it was very interesting, obviously, because there were no set, like I said, there were no set MLB restrictions on the actual bat. The types of wood used to create baseball bats, maple. So the maple pros. Maple is very dense. It's a very dense wood, which is directly related to hardness and durability. 
The wood is very durable, which means that it has more pop. It is a diffuse porpoise wood, closed grain, which is very good because you want to hit against the grain on the bat. And uh, if it's closed, it just makes it so much easier to actually hit against the grain. It holds together under high intense, high intense impact, which is very good for swings because if you're facing like a hundred mile power uh, pitch, you want it to hold together under high intense um, impact so it doesn't break. And it has the hardest surface of the three bats, which are maple, birch, and ash. And maple will not flake on the barrel or splinter because obviously you do not want your uh, barrel flake or splintering when you're hitting a baseball because it starts splintering, then it can start deteriorating and that just will take a downhill spiral from there. The maple cones. Maple is susceptible to gaining moisture throughout the lifespan of the bat, which you don't want to happen because then the bat could possibly start rotting and that would be very easy to break. If it starts gaining moisture, then it, start gain, then it starts gaining weight, which also is, you don't want excess weight on the bat just because of moisture. That would be very hard to swing. That also um, decrease your bat velocity, which should decrease your time to the ball, which can mean the difference between hitting a uh, very fast fastball and not hitting the fastball. And it's rigid and sturdy type of wood, so it can possibly break if a ball is hit off the end of the bat which players do not want because they want their bats to last a long time. Birch pros. Birch is softer wood, which causes it to be more flexible. This flexibility may allow trademark or hit it off the bat, off the end of your hands, because then that could cause it to break. Curly grain wood, which allows it to be more durable when making repetitive contact with the baseball in the same area of the bat, holds together like maple, which players want, because maple holds together very well, and will not flake like ash bats, because ash bats are known for flaking, which players do not want. Birch cons. The softness of birch causes it to be causes it to slightly dent when first being used. Most birch bats will need a break-in period in order for the bat to harden as a result of repetitive impacts for hitting the baseball. So that means the players have to work it in a lot by just hitting the ball in the same spot to make the um, sweet spot of the uh, bat very nice and hard. So once the ball hits there, it will take off. And the surface hardness of new birch baseball bats are not as hard as new maple bats, which might decrease exit velocity, which that can mean the difference between a home run and a pop fly on the uh, warning track. And players obviously want that home run instead of the pop fly because the pop fly is most likely going to be an out. Types of woods used to create baseball bats, ash. Ash pros, more flexible than maple, Players believe that the flexibility allows them to whip the bat through the hitting zone to create more bat speed, which players want because the faster you can whip through the zone, the um, more time you have to hit the uh, baseball and the later you can be. Worst comes to worst, if it's 100 mile baseball, 100 mile power uh, fastball, you can easily just whip your bat through the uh, zone. And tends to be more forgiving when a ball strikes the trademark or end of the bat, which players want because they don't want their bat to break. Ash cons has to be dried to a very low, very low moisture content in order to be used as wood bats, which um, is a con because players don't want their bats really being dried. It's a ring porpoise wood, which is open grain, which is um, worse for um, hitting the ball against the grain. The properties of ash will make the bat continue to dry out during the bat's lifespan, which would cause it to kind of deteriorate if it's not polished or handled correctly and that could possibly make it break. And um, this causes the bat's grains to flake or splinter if the ball hits the face of the grain. And it can also po uh, possibly cause it to break. Most popular type of wood bat. The most popular type of wood bat used in Major League Baseball is maple because approximately 75 to 80% of players use it due to its characteristics, which I previously explained. Followed by the second most used wood bat, which is birch, 
and the third most used wood, which is ash. And ash is also um, less common today because there are less ash trees in um, the tree population. The bat making process. It all starts with the, tr with the trees that lumber mills will chop down to make the baseball bat. They have to choose trees that are healthy because the wood cannot be rotten. The lumber mills will then cut the wood into billets that will be sent to baseball bat manufacturers. Once the billets arrive at the baseball bat companies, they will select the best of all the billets to make bats and discard ones that do not meet the minimum speculations. Some companies will use imperfect wood for trophy bats, but these bats are not meant to be used in games. The billets can, be, can possibly shatter if they usually have air pockets in them, which will not be able to withstand the force of a pitch. And also, um, bats can shatter because if you hit off the end or the, um, if you off the end of the bat or the trademark due to it, the wood, of the, uh, the wood that they use for their bat. Bat making process continued. Once the billets that are good for making bats have been chosen, they then start sculpting them into the shape of a baseball bat. They can either do this by hand or machine. After the bat is sculpted into the dimensions of the baseball that the baseball player requested, the bat gets sanded to make it smooth. Then it is weighed to see how heavy it is. After this, the bat is cupped to make the center of gravity closer to the batter's hands and it gives the hitter a faster swing because the bat is lighter. And the hitter wants a faster swing because um, the lighter the bat, the faster they can get the bat to the zone. And the faster that they can get the bat to the zone, the more chance they have to hit the 100 mile power fastball thrown by an MLB pitcher. And um, because that 100 mile power fastball can come at you very fast. Bat making process continued. After the bat is cut, it gets checked by the dot test to determine where the grain of the wood in the bat is because the hitter wants to hit against the grain of the wood. Once the dot test is complete, the baseball bat gets painted a color of the player's choice and then coated with anti-presperant spray and polished. Once all these steps are done, the bat gets sent to the player. As of, I have here with my baseball bat, um, I helped create this at Tater, and this got all through all that process is uh, was made throughout the whole entire bat making process because they helped me with it, and I also got some stuff done with the machines. Here is a picture of the baseball bat and um, the dot that is used for the dot test. It's by it's on the handle, as you can see um, here. And um, it just shows where the grain is because you want to hit against the grain of the wood. So it shows basically uh, where to hit the ball. And there's a picture of the uh, baseball bat that I got. Here is a picture of me and my teammates throughout the years. Um, that's me as a uh, young kid. There is uh, me hitting a baseball off it. That's a tater bat over there. That's me hitting out of the baseball. That's me as a little kid in t-ball. And um, there's me with my um, friends. I was like probably 11 years old, all-star tournament. And um, what was it in? Kagenshag, where uh, we won that tournament for uh, all-stars. That was a very fun experience. Here is me at um, Tater Bats. There, there's a, those are the wood billets that they use to create the actual um, baseball bat with before it actually becomes in bat form. That's the, what they connect to the machine to um, that rotates it and uh, And here are um, colored, and here's the machine that cuts the um, actual uh, billets into the bat shape. 
Here is a, a diagram of uh, wood baseball bats. This is the knob over here where the player will usually put his hands. That's the grip where the grip tape usually goes. Or if players use grip tape, they also use um, pine tar to um, get a grip for their hands. There's the taper of the bat where also the trademark goes or logo of the bat company. There's the barrel where it's at the closer to the end. Then there's the end of the bat where players do not want to hit off it, then that's usually where the bat gets cut. And there's the length of the bat. I also found this interesting. I found this online. Um, for baseball bats, there's two different types of uh, handles, which is interesting. The traditional bat, which has a round and a straight round handle, that's a traditional wood baseball bat. That's the baseball bat that I had made with um, round knob and um, straight round handle. And uh, here's an axe bat, which there's actually a company called Axe Bats that make these. It's an angled bottom, so it feels a little bit easier on the hands. It's a flared oval shaped handle, which um, it's kind of like swinging an axe, if that makes sense, except you're swinging it horizontal instead of vertical. And uh, some players just like the feel of that more. And um, that's more just based on preference, basically. So how I created this baseball bat. I created this baseball bat with birch wood and a length, with a length of 33 inches. I put the billet, I put the billet into the machine and let the machine do its work. After the machine was done creating the shape of the baseball bat, I put it into another machine that rotates the bat very fast. This makes the sandpaper process easier because you just have to put the sandpaper onto the bat, which um, just yeah, it makes it very easy instead of going throughout the whole entire batch of sandpapering it up and down. After this process, I use the machine that cups the baseball bat by turning a handle of the machine. This makes the bat lighter and easier to swing because it is thus top heavy too. And um, then I worked on coloring the bat and polishing it. And obviously I colored it, go for green, go grizzlies, and uh, polished it at the end after the coloring had dried. Here are the physics of the swing of a baseball player. In the game of baseball, physics applies to a player's swing. For example, when the ball is hit squarely, the bat compresses the ball to around half of its normal thickness. That doesn't mass stung, as the player only has contact with the bat for one one thousandth of a second. Typical force of the bat stricken a ball can exert as much as 800 pounds propelling the ball to over 100 miles per hour, which is the speed needed for a player to hit a home run. And that's how players also generate um, velocities off the bat of about 117 miles per hour when they're facing like either a high 90 mile per hour fastball or a 100 mile per hour fastball. And so they um, generate exit velocity like 117. These are also um, exerting force through their uh, bat speed into the ball and that causes the ball to go very far or very fast on the line. Here are also some physics that I found interesting. Um, there's a trampoline effect that's more around with uh, metal bats, but also wood if um, the uh, ball makes solid contact on the solid part of the shaft where um, it would compress a lot better, which is on the um, sweet spot of the barrel, basically. And that can um, and then there's also a correlation of ball speed versus distance and height. And that's a, I don't know, it's just a lot of interesting information they can find. But this is mainly about um, aluminum bats because aluminum trampoline effect, since the aluminum is a lot of metal, the ball compresses a lot. It would cause a trampoline basically where the ball shoots off and um, can go very far. Project challenges that I faced. Throughout this project, I faced many challenges in finding a company or person that had the knowledge and experience to describe the intricate procedures of developing a baseball bat. Because this requires specific equipment and procedures, and I'm thankful that I found Tater Bats that knew all about this process because they've been in business for a long time and they helped me create this baseball bat at their um, workshop because I also did not have the necessary tools to create um, 
the best because there's specific tools or machines that you need just in order to create it. Special thanks to Tater Bats. This company has helped me throughout my entire bat making process. They have also given me a lot of information that was crucial to the project and they were very kind. They are located in Waterbury, Connecticut. They have an excellent company that creates the best baseball bats that almost never break. And here are my citations. And um, so I guess uh, here's my baseball bat. I have a nice little kind of swing. Very nice, very light. I just love that they helped me create it. And I will probably end up using it during the summer season with the Wood Bat League for 18 years, which is um, my AAU season. Ethan, if you don't mind, can you unshare, you know, stop sharing your screen and we'll ask you a couple of questions? There you go. So I, you, okay. you anticipated my first question, which was, have you used the bat? Um, and it sounds like you're anticipating using it over the summer. I haven't used it yet because I didn't want to really ruin or anything to, for this project. I wanted to keep it nice and um, polished for it, but I ended up probably using it during the uh, summer season because that is really where we can uh, use these. Very cool. I'm going to pause and give others in the audience the opportunity to ask questions or put questions in the chat. Okay. Ethan. Yep. Uh, hey, great job, by the way. I really, uh, it was really cool to see, you know, that you were able to go to, to Tater and actually make the bat itself. It was really cool. Um, how long did it take you to, to put the whole thing together? To put the whole entire um, slideshow together? To no, no, like to make the bat. Make the bat? Honestly, it wasn't that long of a process. At most, maybe 30 minutes because the machinery just makes it so much faster. If you're probably yeah. to do it by hand, it would take us out maybe two months because if you mess up, you have to do this. But it was pretty fast with the machinery. They produced between 50 and 100 bats a day. They produce almost about from 50 to 100 bats for um, an entire day. Wow. So, Ethan, what was, was there, I mean, you did quite a bit of research into the different types of wood and how they, you know, how that affects hitting the ball. Was there anything that was particularly surprising to you or that you didn't really know before as a player? Um, yeah, I didn't really know my, about, much about the physics and um, how small the uh, ball can compress. That would really surprise me. Other than that, I knew a decent amount. I was also surprised about that Ash was um, the third most because they used to be, it was very popular in the 1900s. But then since I think also ash trees were now are kind of vague, you know, no one really sees them. So I think since um, that stopped, they were stopped being used as um, to make bats. But yeah, that's, um, that's really, other than that, I pretty much knew that. I also didn't know as much about the properties of the wood, but now I understand more about why maple and birch are being commonly used today. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, have uh, Ethan, have you used um, your bat in um, all game conditions yet? I haven't used it in all game conditions yet. I haven't really even used it yet because I want to make sure it stayed looking nice for this actual presentation, but I'll probably end up using it um, for uh, my first game, which is this Saturday, honestly, for 18U. So that'll be fun. Get to work this nice bat in. Ethan, tell us a little bit more about getting access to the to the factory. Like how how did that how entailed was that in terms of connecting with them, setting up any kind of meetings or email exchanges, phone calls, like how how arduous was it to get in there to be able to do this? It wasn't that bad. They were actually very nice. And um all it took was really a, an email and a phone call. And um, they said they were very happy to um, help me with the bat making process and um, give me any information that was needed for the actual um, bat making process. 
And they even gave me a lot of MLB restrictions and rules that are in place today because the MLB gets very specific with what the players can actually swing and the actual restrictions that they put on each bat. And even, um, as a matter of fact, if the bat breaks, the MLB has to report the incident and um, look into why the bat broke, which is another kind of an interesting thing. But yeah, they were pretty compliant and, eat, and um, it was very easy to get in touch with them and they were very nice. How do you think this is going to change you, how you play this new I, information you have? Now I actually might look into everything when it actually comes to bat design and also from pitching. Now I might have to look at each bat and um, think, okay, what is the best for this certain type and um, what pitch is best. And uh, for bat design, what type of bat fits my needs the most? Because I didn't think this that much actually went into it at first, but I learned a lot throughout this presentation and uh, this whole entire process. I learned a lot too. I mean, I'm just kind of floored by, you know, I mean, I knew, I knew there was a lot of physics behind baseball and how, you know, how you, the different kinds of pitches, how much spin is on the ball, like all of that I knew factored into the game, but I never really thought about the design of the bat. So it was really kind of cool to hear you talk through it and, and present, you know, how nuanced it really is. Yeah, also, I didn't even look at Bodhi. He helped me up on um, some of the physics work and also just reading up on the National Geographic stuff. There's a lot of stuff that goes on physics in the game of baseball, actually, just in life in general. Physics uh, just applies to almost everything, which was fascinating. That it I, uh, looks like about. Amanda Clark has a question for you. Um, yes. Hi, Ethan. Uh, first of all, congratulations on an outstanding presentation that was very informative and, and really fun. Thank you. Um, and how fortunate for you that you had that manufacturer right in your own backyard. That's really cool. Um, I just had a question about them. Do they ship their bats all over the country or what, what kind of uh, reach do they have? Um, yeah, they'll, re they'll ship their bats all the way across the world. They have some players in Japan that they'll send their um, stuff to. They'll basically get in contact with any player that they can and try to send their bats to them. But an interesting is they don't let them use them for free because of how good they are. Um, but they will ship their bats anywhere where they're Well, that's great. Thank you. Looks like he froze up for a second, his internet connection. So then I'm going to be the show, which is a video game, um, which is interesting. But yeah, they get, um, they will send a bat around the whole entire world. All right, are there any other questions before we let Ethan go? Go ahead. Um, Ethan, will, uh, will you let uh, people know um, after you've played with your bat, uh, what you think of it? Will you okay, keep it in yeah. form? I will let everyone know how this bat handles whenever I play with it. It should handle nicely, though. It's nice and light. Ethan, you were wonderful. You did a great job. Thank, Thank you. you. I loved watching you. Thank you. Ethan, thank you so much. We really enjoyed your presentation. Um, thank you for remembering to show us the work cited. There's a couple of students I forgot to remind them to do that. So I really appreciated that you remembered. Um, and great work. I mean, I'm really kind of impressed that you sought out and found a manufacturer and made that connection and were able to design your own bat. That's really cool. Okay, thank you. Have a great night. Thank you everyone for, for attending this evening. Um, we really appreciate it. Our capstone projects are some of the coolest things that our students do. So we're really glad to get to share it with the community. Have a good night, everyone.